Treating complex illness can be like peeling an onion. There are usually many, many layers. It takes a medical expert to understand factors like mold toxicity, cell danger response, and multiple infections. Let's peel that onion. Dr. Neil Nathan has been practicing medicine for 50 years in family practice and pain management. He is a founding diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. Dr. Nathan is a prolific author with a new book coming out soon. We reached him in Northern California. Welcome, Neil, to our podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. How did you become involved in working with patients with Lyme disease? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, the short version is um, I, I am a board-certified family physician and also certified in pain management. And I was running a regional pain center, hospital-based unit. And we started seeing back in the 80s this odd condition that we called fibrositis, which we now call fibromyalgia. And we began to see an amazing amount of people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and we didn't understand it. It didn't fit any, any of our medical models. And initially, what happens in medicine when you get patients who don't fit whatever model we don't have, it's in their head. So these patients were all referred to psychiatrists and they got therapy and they got um, medication and it didn't work. So it became obvious to me and many others that there's physical causes for this that we're not understanding. And throughout the late 80s and 90s, we began to understand the biochemistry of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And then we began to see a large group of people where our treatments, which did work originally for those conditions, weren't working anywhere near as well. And we began to understand they had Lyme disease. And a little bit later in this journey, by about 2005, we realized that, again, some patients who had Lyme disease weren't responding to our treatments either. And they had mold toxicity. So I kind of came in, if you will, through a back door in which it became increasingly obvious that we were living in an epidemic of Lyme disease and mold toxicity, and that I had to get on really quickly to understand it and understand how to treat it if I were going to help these folks. Now, you mentioned mold. What are some of the contributing factors that keep people in a state of chronic illness? Well, a lot of chronic illness is basically based around the concept of an inflammatory reaction to something that the body can't get a handle on or can't regulate. And those some things are either toxins or infections. In the toxin category, mold toxicity is probably the most common, although there are a lot of other environmental toxins that will get us. And in the infectious area, uh, Lyme disease is probably the most common that we have to struggle with. Although, again, there's mycoplasma and chlamydia infections and viral infections as well. And then does everyone who's exposed to mold actually have a reaction to it? No, not at all. Part of it is genetically determined. If, Although we talk about the genetics of mold, if you stay in a moldy environment and are exposed to enough of it long enough, I think anyone can become mold toxic. It's not purely genetic. But to a certain extent, you can have, oh, say in a school, and schools are commonly moldy because often there's a um, uh, water damage leak in the building and it doesn't get fixed promptly. Schools don't often have the funds to take care of that. And so mold starts to grow. And so you'll see some students who exhibit the symptoms of mold toxicity and some teachers, and many more won't. And so the assumption at that point is, well, I don't know what's wrong with you. I'm not sick. Uh, but the answer is different people have different genetic and biochemical propensities to having that. How can people tell if they have a mold problem in their home or their work environment or schools, for example, like you mentioned? Well, the first thing to do is to think about it. I, I think that 
mold toxicity is one of the biggest epidemics that hasn't been talked about that we understand so far. It's estimated in the States that at least 10 million people right now have some degree of mold toxicity. So we're not talking about something uh, rare, unusual. It's way more common than people realize. Part of the problem, and this is the answer to your question, is to recognize the myriad symptoms that mold toxicity can present with. Like Lyme, mold is a great masquerader. Like Lyme, the inflammation which triggers it can manifest in people very differently based on their genetics and biochemistry. So it can show up in any system of the body. It can show up as general things like fatigue, um, brain fog, cognitive impairment. It can show up emotionally as anxiety and depression and depersonalization and OCD and mood swings. It can show up as shortness of breath a difficulty breathing. It can show up as sinus issues. It can show up as um, gastrointestinal issues. It can show up as pain of every sort. It can show up as every autoimmune disease known to humankind. It can show up um, headaches. So uh, pelvic pain, uh, wherever you could have a symptom, uh, both mold and Lyme can cause it. So the first thing for a human being to understand is, I'm really sick and I'm sick in a lot of different ways. What could be causing this? And again, in my world, mold and Lyme are the two biggest issues. So, I mean, there's so many complex systems. How do you go about diagnosing mold toxicity in a person? Well, first of all, you have to think of it as a diagnosis. Mm. And then you have to ask the right questions. I'm quite sure I missed mold toxicity throughout my entire career until I learned about it in about 2005, at which point I started asking people questions like, have you ever lived in a moldy building or seen mold or smelled it? And most patients' initial reaction is, no, no, I'm fine. And I almost invariably come back to their next visit and go, you know, I'm thinking about that question you asked me. And, you know, I, I, I kind of grew up living in a basement that had a funny smell to it. And <laughs> I lived in a dorm room where it really was clearly moldy. And so you may be living in a pristine environment currently, but you could have picked up mold toxicity anywhere along the line. So, the, the, again, the first thing to do is to think about it as a diagnosis and, and I, that's my main message to get across. And how do you treat mold toxicity? Well, I'll back up and talk more about diagnosing it. Okay. So you don't diagnose it by having a history of it, because again, you could be in a moldy environment and not be sick. However, the most accurate way to tell whether someone has mold toxicity is to get a urine mycotoxin test. Um, we have several labs in our country that do it. I'm not aware of any lab in Canada doing it currently. Um, uh, Real-time lab seems to be the most accurate. Great Plains does a pretty good job as well. You simply collect the urine and you send it to them. It's really pretty straightforward. And then they will catalog for you. Both labs measure different things. So you're going to get different pieces of information from those two labs. But they'll catalog for you the most common mold toxins. And if you have it in your urine, you have it. It's very straightforward. And if that's the case, then we start looking at your home, your work, your car, anywhere where you might be exposed. Once, So there's three aspects of treating mold toxicity. The first is to go over your home or home environment or work environment to be sure that you're not getting exposed currently. This is a big deal and very difficult for a lot of people. Um, if there is mold in your environment, you cannot get well by treating it. My take-home message is mold toxicity is very treatable, but not if you stay in a moldy environment. Now, maybe that seems a little bit obvious, but for many people, this is financially, socially, in many ways, very difficult to either leave that moldy environment and then find a safe one 
And I mean, you're up in BC, and <laughs> I live in Northern California. So we live in a very wet environment. It is highly prone to mold. That's just how it is. The people in our country who live in uh, Florida, where they're exposed to hurricanes on a regular basis, or Texas, again, very moldy environment. In fact, there isn't a place on the planet in which mold can't be an issue. So first job, you have to look at your environment carefully, may even have to hire someone to investigate it and check it out for you. Second, the treatment involves taking what we call binders, which are very simply both natural and pharmaceutical materials that bind mold. And the beauty of the urine mycotoxin test is that it tells us which toxins you've got. And based on that, we can pick the binders that actually work specifically on those toxins. So based on what you've got in your urine, we can design a binder program to pull that out of your body. The third part doesn't apply to everybody. Some people don't need it is that a lot of people have colonized, meaning the mold has started to grow in their sinus and gut areas. And then we have to give them antifungals coupled with biofilm dissolving agents in order to get it out of their body. And at that point, here's the good news, you can be cured. That's great. <laughs> that is really good news. Uh, there seem to be a lot of overlapping symptoms between Lyme, mold toxicity, and other health issues. How do you differentiate which symptoms are due to mold or another infection or toxin? There are a few symptoms that are very specific to mold and Lyme. And you're absolutely right. There is a huge overlap between mold, Lyme, and Bartonella. And by symptom alone, it's very tricky to distinguish it. But if you get a urine mycotoxin test, you can at least know, okay, there's mold in here. Is there Lyme also? Again, we can test for it. But as I'm sure you know, our testing for Lyme is not as accurate as we need it to be. So the Lyme test doesn't always tell us with precision who has it. Now our testing has gotten better. It's still not where we need it to be so that we can absolutely slam dunk, say, yes, you have Lyme or Bartonella or Babesia or Ehrlichia. Can't do that yet with the precision we'd like, but we're better at it than we used to be. In my world, I typically treat the mold first because it is less invasive. It is easier to treat the mold. And if you treat the mold, treating the Lyme becomes easier. You can use antibiotics for shorter periods of time, and we won't mess with the biome quite so badly. So that's my order of doing things. The other part to your question is, I think of chronic complex illness as mm. being layered like an onion, so that if I peel the mold layer off, if someone is 100% better, okay, it was just mold. I might have thought there was Lyme, because the symptoms would fit, but it wasn't because they're well. So then we don't have to go down the Lyme rabbit hole. However, if that patient gets 50 or 70 or 80% better, and they're still not well, what they're left with will point me not only into Lyme, but what are the um, co-infections that might be the most needed to treat first. So we don't always treat Lyme first. For many patients, Bartonella is a bigger issue. And for some people, Babesia is a bigger issue. So the order of treatment varies depending on, okay, what's underneath that once we pull that layer off. Right. Do you think over the years your uh, progression for treating patients has changed? And you mean what by progression? Um. Like you're sort of saying you would treat mold first in this, like that might be your approach now. Do you think you're, you may have treated things differently in the past or has that sort well, of evolved? Sure. When I didn't know about mold, I treated <laughs> Lyme first. Right. Uh, and, and some doctors and, might still be st stuck in that place too, right? And not thinking about and, mold. And, and I think they are. Um, one of my messages to practicing uh, physicians is that I entered this arena through the Lyme doorway. Mm. 
Mm. Most of us did. Right. Most people learned about Lyme first. Mm -hmm. So so, from my perspective, and I don't want to be mean about it, some physicians are still stuck in that place, meaning those complicated symptoms are Lyme for them until proved otherwise. For me, I try to look at it from a broader palette, which is could be Lyme, could be mold. Um, Let me try to tease it apart. So if Lyme physicians aren't looking at mold from early on, they should be. So my perspective is quite a few Lyme patients are treated without looking for mold. And that's a big takeaway message where they keep thinking, well, you still have symptoms. I mean, you still have air hunger or shortness of breath. So you still have babesia or you still have anxiety and um Uh, sensitivities of various sorts. So you still have Bartonella. And in point of fact, they have mold. The the physician may have adequately treated those conditions and not realize it because they're not looking for mold. So one of my take-home messages is if you have Lyme, that please ask your physician to check you for mold. You don't want to miss that. Yeah, and it's nice if you can scratch that off the list if it's one of the things you don't have to deal with. <laughs> uh, absolutely. If yeah. you don't have it, fabulous. Yeah. But but mold toxicity weakens the immune system and predisposes to Lyme. Lyme weakens the immune system and predisposes to mold. There are an amazing percentage of people who have both. It's not rare. It's more common than anyone would realize. Um, I know... I work very closely with Rich Horowitz in the States here. And Rich is, from my perspective, one of the best Lyme docs anywhere. And Rich has found that for his patients who are not getting better, 70% of them have mold also. So it's not rare. No, not at all. So how is the central nervous system impacted in chronic illness? Profoundly. Um, again, this global inflammation affects the central nervous system in a number of ways. And there are three conditions which I find if we don't look for them and treat them, patients will have difficulty getting well. And those three conditions are limbic dysfunction, vagal nerve dysfunction, and mast cell activation. And those are very common. Not everybody has it in mold. I would say that maybe 70% of my patients have mast cell activation, for example. A higher percentage have limbic dysfunction and vagal nerve dysfunction. But those are not occasional. They are almost the rule rather than the exception. So what you see from those particular areas are people who have limbic dysfunction. And I know you've talked to Annie Hopper about this. That's right, yes. Um, Those who have limb dysfunction, the limbic system is the part of the brain that regulates and monitors and controls primarily emotion and sensitivity. To a lesser extent, it will affect um, cognition, energy, and pain. And uh, most Lyme patients and mold patients will go, well, I've got that. So if, if a patient has anxiety, depression, depersonalization, OCD, mood swings, um, they have limbic involvement. If they have sensitivity to anything, chemicals, light, sound, food, um, EMF, which is increasingly a problem, okay, limbic. So most of my patients have limbic involvement. And here's the deal. If you don't treat that early on, even doing the right things, that patient may not be able to heal. I think you had asked when we were talking earlier to talk a little bit about cell danger response. So let me weave that in here. Yes, that's my next question. (laughs) Great. We're on the same wavelength here. (laughs) So for those of you not familiar with it, the cell danger response is a brilliant model of chronic illness developed by Bob Navio, who is a a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And uh, Dr. Navio has been pioneering this work for, I don't know, over a decade. 
The cell danger response is a an understanding of how toxins, infection, and stress will affect the body on a cellular level, which extends to the entire body. And if the body feels threatened by a toxin, an infection, or stress, it will essentially shut down. It will essentially go into survival mode. And th- until it feels safe again, it's not going anywhere. So it, you could be working with a functional integrative uh, healthcare provider, and they can measure deficiencies in zinc or vitamin B6, or um, they can tell you you have mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, mitochondrial dysfunction, everyone who has this shutdown, the mitochondria shut down because they are the organelles, the parts of the cell that monitor the body for safety and do the shutting down. So if you're going to set off a cell danger response, it is the mitochondria that do it and control it. So I sometimes have patients who go to a, a major medical center and they get extensive testing and they come back, you have mitochondrial dysfunction. And I groan. It's like, <laughs> well, of course you have. I mean, duh. Of course you have mitochondrial dysfunction. That isn't a diagnosis. It's a consequence of what's causing it. Did you guys look for the cause? Right. Usually, usually not. So getting so this is about safety. And mm-hmm. here's the deal. Limbic, vagal, and mast cell systems are all about safety. That's what they're designed for. Mm-hmm. So those three systems, as they shut down, in order to protect the body, not hurt it, they become over time, increasingly oversensitive, overreactive, hypervigilant is the right way to talk about it, so that you've got two neurological systems, limbic and vagal, and you have a cellular system, which are mast cells, scrutinizing the stimuli in your body, internal stimuli and external stimuli for safety. And if they don't think you're safe, you're not going anywhere. So in order to not only feel better quickly, treating the limbic system, the vagal nerve system, and mast cell activation is super important for most of patients who've gotten sick. So that's my quick overview. I think I remember in one of your interviews, you mentioned that people can actually get stuck in that state as well of cell danger response and that they can't heal if they're stuck in that state. Is that right? Right. Right. It's all about safety. Mm-hmm. If if you can't talk it out of it, if there's still toxin in the body, if there's still infections, the body can't heal. It basically goes into survival mode and going, I'm going to only use a teensy bit of my resources so I don't waste my resources until I feel safe again, until the toxin is gone, until the infection is gone, until the stress is gone then they can respond really, really well. So often limbic vagal mast cell treatment must precede mold or Lyme treatment. Right. And why do you think it's important for physicians to understand the cell danger response? Because that's what this is all about. Yeah. The the cell danger response goes over in detail the, the more precise chemistry of how exactly the shutdown process occurs. For example, the the cell stops methylating. And methylation, uh, some of you may know, is a major biochemical process in which hundreds of materials are made and supplied by this biochemical process called methylation. Now, we shut down methylation for a reason. For example, if you're infected with a virus, a virus cannot replicate or grow unless it hijacks your chemistry and uses your ability to methylate for it to make more virus. So the cell shuts it down. So again, another common diagnosis that I hear is, you're not methylating well, I'm going to give you the supplements you need to methylate. That's well and good, but that's a downstream effect. You're not going to be able to take those supplements and use them until you're safe again. So 
Methylation, for example, is covered in the whole cell danger response. In the cell danger response, which is this very detailed, organized process of how exactly a cell protects itself, um, when we understand it, then we can fix it. That's the essence of understanding the cell danger response. So again, another event that occurs is that the chemistry of a cell when it's normal, is that it is able to detoxify very well. Mm, so, right. so if you're exposed to heavy metals like mercury or lead or things like that, you can be exposed and you can get rid of them. If you are in a cell danger response, the chemistry of the cell changes so that it is no longer able to do that. And you get an accumulation of heavy metals in the body. And again, um, integrative medical docs can look at this and go, oh, you have uh, lead toxicity, you've got mercury, I've got to treat that. You do, but if you could undo the cell danger response, the body would be able to get rid of that burden all by itself. So again, understanding it allows you to prioritize what you have to do in what order. We will pause the interview there for now. Come back and join us to hear part two of our interview with Dr. Neil Nathan. Mm-hmm. 